Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the Department of Labor. I'm pleased to be joined today by Labor Deputy Commissioner Michael Harrington, uh, Acting Education Secretary Heather Boucher, Betsy Bishop from the Vermont Chamber. And we also have additional members of our team from the Departments of Labor, Corrections, Folk Rehab, and the Vermont Community High School. So welcome and thank you all for being here. For the last two years, many of you have heard me talk about the importance of growing Vermont's economy and making Vermont more affordable. It's the top priority of my administration, and growing and strengthening our workforce is one of the most single, most important things we can do to make Vermont more affordable and grow our economy. But for the past several years, progress in this area was elusive, and we saw consistent and at times rapid reduction in Vermont's workforce. From April of 2009 at the time, to the time I took office, we had roughly 16,000 fewer workers in the workforce. These aren't just statistics. We hear every day from businesses around the state who have good jobs and openings to fill, but are struggling to find the people to fill them. Last fall, I appointed Sarah Buxton and Dustin Degree to develop strategies and identify all our workforce assets across every agency and department that will help close this gap. And as it turns out, about half my cabinet was working on workforce issues this legislative session, which shows just how important I think this issue is to our state. Secretary Sherling and his team worked on several bills, as did Commissioner Curley, Deputy Commissioner Harrington, and others at Labor, as well as the agencies of education and human services. With so much hard work and focus on workforce expansion across the administration and legislature, I want to highlight some positive trends we've seen in our workforce data. Since the beginning of this calendar year, Vermont employers have, in total, added about 4,500 workers. This has increased the size of Vermont's labor force to over 349,000 people the highest it's been since April of 2011. At the lowest point, in October of 2016, Vermont's labor force had contracted to about 330,000. Since the beginning of the year, our labor force as a percentage of total population has also steadily climbed. This means Vermonters who are here but not working or unable to find steady employment are making their way back into the labor force. I will, however, um, say that this, uh, this pre press conference uh, is not meant to declare victory. And I want to repeat that. This press conference today is not meant to declare victory, but instead to spotlight some encouraging trends while recognizing we still have big economic challenges in front of us. And for the press in the room here outside of uh, the labor department, you may at the very least be encouraged by this announcement because you, it means you won't be hearing me say 631 anymore, at least not the six. Let me be clear, this is not to say our labor force numbers have returned to their pre-recession levels because they haven't. But the six in the 631 referred to the average rate at which our labor force was seeing a decline from its peak of, of uh, April of 2009 to the time I took office. While I know many of you love that talking point, the, the goal of using it was always to shine a spotlight on our challenges, but it was always meant uh, to be retired. I will, however, continue our work to strengthen and grow the workforce and address our shrinking student population, which unfortunately still uh, is uh, standing at three as well as continue to lead the way here in Vermont on addressing our opioid challenges represented by the one. I also want to note, this progress is the result of a number of factors and the work of many across the state, particularly our job creators and those committed to being, uh, becoming employed and moving up the economic ladder, as well as the work of my team, the legislature, educators, private partners, and, much, and many more. As I've said many times, growing our workforce should be the number one priority of all elected officials regardless of party. And I hope that continues as we have much more work to do. With that, 
I'd now like to turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Michael Harrington, who will talk about uh, some of the new and improved workforce development strategies taking place at the Department of Labor. Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. I, too, am excited to be able to share in this announcement. From the moment this administration touched down, staff at the Department of Labor set out to develop a new approach to workforce development, one in which employers and job seekers were served with equal effort and attention and priority was given to projects that directly impact our labor force participation. That said, it was quickly realized that this effort would require a collaborative approach, not only between and among state agencies and departments, but with educational institutions, training providers, technical centers, small businesses, industry leaders, local municipalities, nonprofit organizations, trade associations, and the list goes on. Needless to say, growing Vermont's labor force is a highly complex arrangement where both economic development and community development converge and in some cases collide. In the end, the focus had to change from a place-based system where individuals and businesses come to us for services to a people-based system where services are delivered to them. Our work with the Department of Labor has taken us from the Department of Economic Development to the Department of Corrections and has included a variety of stops in between, including the Department for Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, the Department for Vermont <coughs> Health Access, and the Department of Libraries, just to name a few. As the governor mentioned, over the past 24 months, the state has aligned its resources to support a variety of workforce expansion efforts, and it is my pleasure to highlight just a few. In the areas of work-based learning, apprenticeships have seen an increase of nearly 40% over the past two years, and a number of registered apprentices, uh, apprentices and an additional 17 new programs. In keeping with the collaboration model, the state has also created a state apprenticeship team made up of members from a variety of agencies and departments. Additionally, the state continues to invest well over $350,000 for internships and additional on-the-job training. In the area of reemployment and at-risk populations, Labor has partnered with the Department of Corrections to provide enhanced training opportunities to prepare individuals for release, as well as those who have been recently released and are trying to re-engage with the labor force. Through par partnerships within the Agency of Human Services, we have also been able to place workforce development staff at at least one recovery center in each region of the state. And in the Department of Children and Families, our team is now able to collaborate across systems with DCF case managers to co-enroll youth in labor programs. In partnering with the Department of Economic Development, we have been able to offer additional grant opportunities to regional development corporations across the state to enhance workforce development efforts. Additionally, this past January, we were able to fund a pilot project in Rutland County by partnering with the Rutland Economic Development Corporation to place career coaches in both Mill River and Otter Valley High Schools. The program focuses on specialized skill development and employment in Rutland County after graduation. In the area of youth, the Department of Labor has seen a 66% increase in its summer youth employment program and a projected 2018 investment of nearly $200,000. Moreover, the Department of Labor has invested $100,000 in the Vermont Talent Pipeline Project which looks at growing industries and works to identify future industry demands. Over the next 12 months, we're excited to announce the Vermont Returnship Program, an investment of $100,000 that will go to train individuals who are looking to re-enter the workforce. And another exciting opportunity that we'd like to point out is an additional $400,000 we've been able to secure for adult career technical education equipment to be shared through tech centers across the state. And finally, we are looking at other areas within the Department of Labor, such as unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, and occupational health and safety for ways to encourage business growth by reducing costs and increasing employment opportunities. What I've just mentioned is a true weaving of services in both uh, the areas of reducing duplication and improving efficiency, and in the end, an increase in funding by leveraging a variety of opportunities. Addressing our labor force issue has been the number one priority of this department, and I would dare say by most departments within state government. 
And there is no doubt in my mind that the uptick in labor force numbers is a direct result of the hard work of the employees here at the Department of Labor and our partners across the state. Thank you very much, and I'd now like to have Betsy Bishop come up. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, less about the state programs and a little bit more about what I see from the uh, private sector and employment uh, area. But first, I'd like to say just a big thank you to the state, to the governor, for putting a real focus on the workforce. It's something that we have needed um, as we have seen a tightening labor market with consistent unemployment at under 3%, 2.8%. seeing um, how employers are reacting to that. One of the things that, um, in addition to the numbers that the governor has shown and uh, that we have seen from the Department of Labor, the Vermont Futures Project has really looked at data about what we're going to need in the future in addition to what's happening today. And one of the things that we have done is we've done a calculation around what is the workforce gap. How many workers do we need a year? And when you take into consideration how many people are graduating from high school and college and going directly into the workforce, and then you think about how many people are leaving the workforce through retirements or moving, uh, natural attrition, those types of things, uh, the Futures Project has come up with a number of 11,000 workers annually is what Vermont needs to keep up with its current rate of growth, which is about 2%. So the concept is that we have about 8,000 people who are coming into, uh, the, into the supply, but we need almost uh, 19,000 uh, workers a year. So that is the struggle ahead of us, and seeing this change that's being announced today is very helpful. Um, so how do we close that gap? Because we know that there's no one thing, one policy, any silver bullet, a bus that holds 10,000 people a year. There's none of that that can happen easily. So it's a series of efforts that need to happen. Um, and we would start with both marketing and incentives. We have seen the governor and the legislature come together this year in both those areas and support a marketing effort to at least <coughs> tell people who live away from here that we want them to come here not only to visit for a weekend but to consider being here for a lifetime. That marketing effort is small and growing. Uh, maybe you've seen the effort in that through Think Vermont, through the Digital Ambassadors Program. It's excellent. Um, I think DOL has got some strong programs that are working to do that as well. So telling other people is, is first on the list. Uh, we've seen incentive programs um, also be promoted this year, and I think that there's a willingness now to, that the problem is well understood, and these are the two first areas that we're seeing how we recruit people from away. Um, in addition to the many programs that Deputy Commissioner Harrington just spoke of, while those are not things that grab headlines every day, they are the programs that employers use, that employees need, prospective employees need, and continue, and we, we have to continue with those. Um, efforts are underway. We heard some of those programs uh, that are through the Department of Labor, but employers are doing their part, too, to think about the Vermonters that are not in the workforce that need to be. So helping new Americans get into the workforce, I see that every day at private companies. I was at Burn Chocolates uh, last week. They have a very active new American program. Uh, Food Science has moved their uh, building from Essex to Williston to be on the um, on the bus route so that new Americans can find it easier to get to work because transportation is an issue. Um, we've seen Autumn Harp working on these things as well. 
um, as we address the opiate problem in Vermont, how do we get folks with substance abuse histories into the workforce employers with this tight, ready, with this tight market are ready to meet that challenge and are doing creative things to be able to do that. And we heard earlier uh, speaking about getting folks who were previously incarcerated. These are the people that we need to get off of the sidelines and into the workforce to fuel our economic growth. And employers, private employers are doing their part as well in being creative in how they retain and recruit workers. Competitive, and wages, competitive wages and benefits have always been a part of the equation, but we are seeing more flexibility and more innovation now, uh, tailored really based on employees' needs. This is new. So we're seeing things like uh, student loan help, uh, down payment on first home help. We've seen progressive leadership from uh, working teams, community volunteering. We're also seeing um, certain training for a whole career path as opposed to specific training just for your job today. Um, and what's most encouraging that we're seeing is flexible work arrangements. While we hear most of this in relation to millennials, it's valuable to retain the older workers and encourage them to stay in the workforce longer. And it's also important for workers um, who have family pressures, either with children or on the uh, parent population. So in conclusion, employers continue to assess their workplaces uh, and, their, and even their spaces to address the new world of work. They need to be competitive to recruit and retain employers. Thank you. And at this point, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about uh, the labor issues first. Are wages going up? All this competition for workers, fear, you use the word fierce. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that'd be the best attractor. Anecdotally, I would say yes. Uh, absolutely, supply and demand uh, always kicks in when you have a tight labor market and you're searching for workers, so uh, the, the, the uh, employee wages uh, do go up. I don't know if we have any statistics on that, Michael, but... I don't have statistics, but I can tell you with the employers uh, that I've talked with, um, when they're looking to compete for talent, uh, they are having to offer a higher wage. Uh, and we've seen that uh, in a couple of very significant cases over the past two years. Uh, Anything you want to add to that? To, yeah, I'd love to add to that. I think wages is key. So we always think about competitive wages as the first line of defense. Like maybe if I raise their salary, they'll stay longer. Um, what we're finding in this particular workforce, in this new world of work, is that wages is one part of, of the equation. And that um, there's an expectation that there's a competitive wage, and there's an expectation that you have sort of what are considered standard benefits, um, health care, paid time off, those types of things. But these other ideas around flexibility in the workforce is becoming um, equally important to, to folks in the workforce. So the conversation is, yes, a little bit about wages, but there's also other needs that employers are addressing. And it's, it's becoming more tailored to a person as opposed to across the board. As you can see, uh, this was in November of 16 uh, here, and it was fairly stagnant across until December of 17. It started to uptick at that point. We weren't sure. I mean, many have identified uh, that time as uh, seeing some increase, uh, but we weren't sure if that was going to be sustainable. Because as you can see, it, it does have its flow uh, throughout the, throughout this space in time. But now we're seeing it uptick, 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 uptick continuing. Uh, our challenge, of course, is going to be workers for the workforce. We can continue to grow the workforce, but if we don't have people to fill the jobs, uh, we're not going to see that increase. And that's why we have to focus on demographics. We have to bring more people into the state in order to uh, continue that increase. Uh, obviously, some of this is uh, done nationally. Uh, the national economy is heating up, but our economy is heating up as well here in Vermont. So we're seeing some positive trends. 
and we want to continue to highlight this uh, because a lot of what we see in, uh, in business and in economics is uh, consumer confidence. And if we have top confidence in the economy, it will continue to grow. Uh, if, uh, if we see some downturns, then uh, we see a, a contracting at times. So uh, we see some, some growing trends here, which are encouraging. And we'll continue to watch this as time moves forward. That's a pretty obviously a pretty steep line, but going from 345 to 349 is a percentage increase. I don't do that at the top of my head, but it doesn't seem very much. Uh, how, how significant is that? I mean, well, it's a lot better than right here. Uh, <laughs> this went down, and this was saying uh, stagnant. I mean, this is uh, dramatic, uh, and I think if you look over time, it's about 2%. Uh, again, yeah, about 2%, which is, which is, you know, that's. That's growth uh, that uh, is sustainable, I believe. So your, your state economist last uh, Friday said that the economy was going about as fast as it can and unemployment was at basically historic lows and there isn't any capacity for the economy to grow any more than it has. Um, so where does your confidence come from? Well, again, seeing the numbers and the increase in the workforce, I think that that's, uh, that that's encouraging. Uh, the number of businesses that are looking to expand, that's encouraging. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen, a $35 million housing bond, leveraging another $65 million uh, for the largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen, that's encouraging. Uh, so what we need now, again, is to focus on bringing more people into the state. And, and this is something that I've highlighted over the last couple of years uh, through uh, legal immigration, uh, through trying to keep people here in the state, finding opportunity for them. Decent, affordable housing is important. Uh, opportunities as well as, uh, as affordability. And, and that's why we're focusing on uh, the affordability issues, the, the, the property taxes, and, and some of the tax uh, the, uh, burdens that uh, many Vermonters face. So again, it's uh, all working together uh, try for the, uh, the common goal of improving the prosperity of Vermont. So, what, what on average now is the number of uh, people from on losing from its labor force every day? Well, we, at this point in time, it's, it's difficult because we're actually uh, we're increasing uh, the number at this point, right? Uh, so, we took the average over from 2009, I believe, uh, until, until I took office. That's where we came up with the average of six. Uh, but at this point in time, we're, we're increasing. We're still below what we were in 2009. We're, I think it was two, uh, by about 12,000 people. Uh, but again, as we increase, uh, tough to put a number behind there. But if you, you know, between now uh, and uh, 2009, it's about four to four and a half uh, to one. The administration has had a few sort of small initiatives, uh, the, stay, the stay initiative and then the uh, reduction for uh, state colleges. Have you seen anyone move well, I, I mean, again, we're seeing everything that uh, we're, every uh, tool in the toolbox is being utilized. And I believe that uh, we are seeing uh, some positive effects, uh, results from that, uh, but nothing that has been measured other than what we're seeing here. It's going to take some time uh, for that to work. Uh, the, the many. There's sure. about a thousand people that have signed up for the stay to stay uh, lister. And I think there's only been, there was about one a quarter. So there's only been, uh, I think, two uh, actual status days at this point. So we'll have to check if there's been anybody that's moved. But uh, the thousand registrants that have signed up is pretty promising. So the, the leap started at the end of last year, beginning of this year. What, uh, what do you attribute that to? You know, what you know I think I, I attribute it to a lot of different factors. Uh, again, confidence. Uh, the job creators, the, the businesses that are that had the confidence to start expanding, bringing more people in, offering uh, more employment uh, as well. You know, just confidence of, uh, of everyday Vermonters uh, and trying to uh, spending more, seeing uh, some hope on the horizon, the national economy heating up, uh, and again, our, uh, our economy starting to improve, uh, improve uh, uh, in, in, uh, in small steps. So. Uh, it's uh, it's all the above. I think it's a, it's an effort uh, by those that I mentioned uh, from all different sectors of our state government, from the legislature, uh, the national economy, and uh, of course the job creators who, who are providing for opportunity uh, for many Vermonters. 
the uh, uh, we're not seeing statistically we're really not seeing any wage growth. In fact, last month, again, the state economists on Friday reported that in June, uh, purchasing power actually dipped a little bit. There seems to be a fundamental disconnect where, at this point in the economic cycle, we should be seeing dramatic wage increases, and we're not. The, you know, the, the benefits of the economic expansion seem to be going all to the top earners. Well, again, What's I believe, uh, again, this is anecdotal. Uh, <coughs> when I'm talking to those uh, businesses, the job creators, I spoke to some this morning, and, and uh, they are increasing uh, wages and benefits uh, because there's competition uh, for those workers. So uh, I, I think we'll see uh, that increased growth. It will happen. It is happening, and, uh, and I believe that it will continue as long as we uh, continue to focus on those areas of affordability and growing the economy, uh, we'll see a natural progression of wage growth. Um, keep returning to state economists, but uh, they basically attributed the growth of the economy entirely to two things. One is tax, federal tax cuts, the other is federal deficit spending sort of supercharging the economy. Uh, in terms of Vermont's prosperity, Vermont's economy, is there a portion of the growth that you can attribute to your policies and your administration's work? Well, again, uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not standing here to take credit, uh, but I think we are focusing in the right areas. And, and again, when I took office, I, I pledged to, to, to focus on the economy, focus on the demographics, focus on on areas where we can continue to, to grow the economy, make it more affordable, protect the most vulnerable all at the same time. And I think as a result, um, we're seeing some positive trends. Uh, but it takes those, again, those job creators, those businesses there who are out there uh, to, uh, to have the confidence in growing their businesses and expanding their businesses. Uh, I think uh, bringing some of those businesses from Canada, uh, we've had some success there. And I think that there's more, this fertile ground in that regard, I believe we can have more uh, Canadian businesses coming into our state uh, in the near future. So uh, I think everything together, and, and, and again, in the corrective action we've taken in terms of taxes and fees over the last two years has a, a, an effect, a, a positive effect on, on those uh, keeping more money in the pockets of, uh, of those hardworking Vermonters uh, and giving some encouragement to the businesses that we're paying attention. I think all told, all of us pulling in the same direction has led to what we're seeing on some of the charts. This might be where you don't have to stay or can stay if you'd like. Uh, you might get into some other areas. <laughs> um, you know, this is something that uh, obviously they're going to have this conversation on the national level. Uh, we're seeing it right now, 3D printing. Who would have thought uh, we could produce uh, firearms with 3D printing uh, just uh, 10 years ago? I, I certainly did not. Uh, but it's uh, it's an area that it, it appears that they'll be uh, dealing with on the national level. How are your thoughts on keeping state employees safe? Well, I would say from a state employee standpoint, uh, we have a responsibility as, as the employer, uh, as, the, uh, as the administration, to keep our state employees safe. And we'll continue uh, the work in that regard to make sure that we're, we're doing just that. Uh, and so this uh, this does, you know, plastic firearms uh, does, uh, uh, I think, increase the, the complexity of uh, some of the metal detectors and so forth and so on. Uh, so we'll, uh, but we'll continue to do what we can uh, in terms of uh, everything that we've got uh, uh, in the pipeline uh, to keep our, our uh, workforce safe. Well, I'm always concerned. I mean, I'm always cautious. I'm always concerned. Um, we, uh, again, our, the responsibility falls on us uh, to make sure that we're doing all we can to protect them. Do you support the efforts to ban the publication of these blueprints online? I, I certainly, you know, it's a it's a bit of a slippery slope in some respects. Uh, if you're mass producing uh, weapons of this nature, uh, there should be some oversight, obviously. 
Um, if uh, and again, I you know it's it's difficult because at this point in time, I believe you can still build your own weapon uh, right now. I believe, uh, but uh, I'm not sure you know with this new technology that everyone anyone would have foreseen this coming. So. Again, I look forward to the conversation on a national level. I think it's the president has even uh, uh, tweeted or spoken about it. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of interest in Congress uh, at this point in time. So we'll see where it all plays out. But, uh, but I think that uh, it's something that should be addressed. Your uh, Climate Action Commission put out its report yesterday. Uh, have you read it? Do you have any reaction to it? I have not read it yet. It was, uh, it was brought forward yesterday. I'm going to sit down with the uh, with a committee in the next uh, uh, two to three weeks uh, so that they can tell me about it, uh, and then we'll move on from there. Uh, there's, a, as I understand it, uh, there's about 50 recommendations within the, the report, and I'm sure there are some that we'll be able to move forward on. So I thank them for their good work. I think it was uh, well worth it, and uh, look forward uh, to uh, to having positive results as a as a result of their uh, their good work. One of the recommendations was increasing funding for weatherization of homes for uh, vulnerable Vermonters. Is that something you support? Absolutely. I've been a supporter of weatherization. It's it's like uh, being a true conservative uh, because you you're preventing something from happening, and uh, and I believe that uh, uh, that approach uh, has benefits across the spectrum. So uh, we had uh, moved forward. We we tried to move forward with a uh, a plan uh, to to do the best more in weatherization. Um, we're going to continue. That didn't. Uh, that failed to make it uh, through to the uh, uh, through the legislature. But we'll we'll continue to work in that regard. Senator Patrick Lee is looking to secure funding uh, federally for election security grants. Uh, do you have any uh, knowledge of security risks uh, that, that are part of the response? Yes, yeah. I'm not aware. Uh, probably a better uh, question for our Secretary of State. Uh, but uh, Secretary Condos, from what I've read and gathered, uh, feels our system is secure. Uh, but a uh, better question for him. Where are you at with your search for a new education secretary? Uh, we are uh, very close. Stay tuned. You'll, you'll, we'll be hearing uh, something very, very shortly. And is the acting secretary in the running for that position? Um, she was uh, not in uh, one of the finalists. She never applied uh, for that position. Governor, you're hosting the, uh, the New England governors and the premiers uh, coming up. What's on the agenda for that? Well, we'll be talking about uh, energy. Uh, we'll be talking about NAFTA. We'll be talking about uh, regionalization, how we can work together, uh, and uh, certainly uh, in the uh, trying to do whatever we can uh, to further the region uh, forward. And uh, so I think it'll be uh, well worth uh, the effort and uh, look forward to having the uh, premiers and new governors uh, there at the time. Are the NAFTA, uh, the national NAFTA discussions going to hinder you? I wouldn't say it's, it will hinder us uh, at all uh, because uh, I believe uh, those of us in the Northeast uh, uh, are certainly on a different uh, uh, wavelength communication uh, than the rest of the, the country. Uh, we uh, we know here in Vermont, uh, Canada, uh, Quebec in particular is our largest trading partner, valuable to us, and uh, we need each other. And, and I believe that uh, the premiers as well as the new governors appreciate that and recognize that. You got a primary election coming up here. I heard that. Couple weeks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is it like uh, campaigning as an incumbent? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it is much different uh, than the first time around uh, when there was a, an open seat. Uh, obviously, I take this uh, seriously. Uh, there are issues uh, with a low, uh, an expected very low primary turnout uh, because uh, when I'm speaking anecdotally with many Vermonters, they don't even realize we have a primary in August. And uh, so it's concerning. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, Vermonters get out there to vote. Uh, that here are the candidates and uh, and uh, and uh, vote for those who, who they think will best represent their values. Do you think 14-year-olds should be legally eligible to run for governor? Um, I think we should probably take a look at that. To be perfectly <laughs> honest with you, but uh, but at this point in time, it's perfectly legal, and and Ethan's doing a great job. And and uh, when I hear him on the radio, I, I'm amazed uh, at his age. Uh, 
uh, and his, uh, his sense of maturity. So you'd support perhaps addressing that? I think, I think practically speaking, uh, I think uh, you should at least be able to get your driver's license at the time you become governor. You get driven all over the place. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is true. That is true. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for coming in. Or coming out. Coming out, that's right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.